Uh, today, I'm speaking with Dr. Stacy Ochoa. She's, uh, of course, a dental sleep medicine specialist, but primarily, well, I don't know if primarily, she's a pediatric airway expert. We'll be talking a lot about that. In fact, that's going to be her topic at the 10th Annual Sleep Roundtable. Um, your experience in dental sleep medicine is important in getting there, but, but obviously, you've pioneered a lot of this pediatric stuff. And... Gosh, I'm glad you have, because that's a very needed field. And I will admit to, yeah, I've paid attention to it, but I haven't been the, the big proponent of it that I should have been. We primarily see an adult population in my practice, and I think most yes. sleep dentists, <clears throat> that's who they market to, and that's who they see. First, I want to hear your personal story about sleep. Tell me what got you first interested in treating sleep and then what has then moved you into the pediatric spot? Okay. And you're actually in that beginning journey, Kent, <laughs> but uh, it started. And I think my story is similar to a lot of people, you know, you get into this because you have a family member that can't tolerate CPAP or you yourself have apnea or an issue with, with sleep disordered breathing. Um, and for me, it was my dad and I was lucky enough to get into an associateship practice almost 20 years ago with a dentist who was very mindful of sleep apnea and was using oral appliance therapy. I didn't know anything about it, but I was privy to screening. So I knew some, I knew how to identify someone struggling. So got my dad to the sleep physician he was immediately put on a CPAP machine and he just could not tolerate it. And um, the sleep physicians came to me and said, why aren't you making him one of those devices that these dentists are making then? Uh -huh. And uh, I was, you know, I'm one of those people like, oh, if I can't do it perfectly, I shouldn't do it at all. You know, it's a little analysis paralysis that all dentists, it's drilled in our heads in dental school. And um Eventually the sleep physicians pushed me. So I went to my local lab and I said, look, who do I learn dental sleep medicine from? And you were the person they directed me to. So you were the very first really dental sleep. Yeah. yeah. I took your course when you were teaching. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't Dallas. I flew to Dallas. I had known you through other avenues, like six months, miles and stuff, but took your course, got my dad in an appliance and it really helped him a lot, changed his life. Um, he had a lot of health problems, um, as a lot of our sleep patients do, a lot of metabolic syndrome issues. He was pretty sick, a lot of other heart issues going on too. And, you know, then I started having kids and my kids, you know, I, I knew that kids could, you know, snore and have issues. And I did all the things that were taught, you know, tonsils and adenoids, get them to the ENT. Right. And I did that and they'd be great for six months and then boom. So I knew something was missing and, you know, I was, to be honest, I got a little ticked off with dental sleep medicine for a while. I mean, if I just get raw about it, I, I felt like, you know, my dad was severe. He was struggling. He had a lot of things going on. I couldn't figure out what was going on with my kids. I just was getting angry um, because there weren't answers. And then on Valentine's of 2017, I was actually on a plane going to another pediatric expansion, trying to figure this all out, flying course to course to course, you know, which I felt very guilty about as a parent but I also knew I needed to help my kids and nobody was giving me answers in dental sleep, the orthodontist, the orthodontist, nobody was giving me answers. So, and my dad was like, you're flying so much. Why, why are you leaving so much? And I said, dad, as much as I want my kids to grow up and be like you when they're older, I don't want them to have your health issues. <laughs> so, yeah. um, he got it. And uh, I told them, you know, they're breathing through their mouth. They can't breathe right. And, and my dad said, I never was able to breathe through my nose growing up. And I'm like, Oh, light bulb. That's interesting. And, um, so I'm on a plane going to, um, Virginia, West Virginia, getting ready to take off. And my phone keeps ringing, ringing, ringing. I'm, you know, swipe, swipe. 
And I got this weird feeling like you have to take it. It was my brother. And I answered and we had all been texting as a family because it's my dad's birthday in a few days. And so we were all texting about his birthday and he was on the text thread. And we're all just going back and forth all day long. And I get on the plane to leave after work. So anyway, my brother's calling me and I I got that weird feeling that a lot of us get that intuition of, and it was so weird, Kent, like I looked at the phone and I thought, if I answer this, it's going to change my life. It was this instant feeling and uh, it did. And my, my brother said that my dad had passed um, in his sleep the night before and my mom left for work to come to my office. And she kept looking at him and he looked so peaceful and she didn't want to bother him because it was so hard for him to get a good night's sleep. So she didn't want to bother him, but in reality he had passed. So she saw him gone that morning, comes to work. Um, it, It just was very, I got very angry to be honest after that. I, I didn't want to take any adult sleep stuff. My dad, mind you that night, it was Valentine's. He got my mom flowers and some chocolate covered strawberries that were in the fridge still when, after the funeral. And, um, you know, she kept telling him to put his sleep device in because he would start to fall asleep and forget to put it in. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it was just a hundred percent his apnea, but there's, I get it. He was a sick person. He had heart disease and apnea and all these things, but it all snowballs to that you know, and it compounds, you know, years of illness, years of sickness, years of being missed. But I got angry. I was like, I felt like I failed him. You know, what's weird. My worst nightmare, Kent, was that my dad would die with my device in his mouth. Oh, wow. So on one hand, it was like, okay, God, (laughs) you knew that I would feel like the worst daughter on the planet if my dad had that device in his mouth. So, but it wasn't in his mouth that night. And so then I'm thinking, well, then that could have been what happened, but he, you know, eventually had a heart attack in his sleep and didn't wake up. So I just went full blown with the kids. Like, you know, I, I, um, with, with adults, we can manage it, you know, and but sometimes you feel like you're beating a dead horse with adults. You're, you're, you're trying to convince them how sick they are. And they just are like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and you try to figure out why they want to be better and and focus on that. Like, what's your victory? What's your win? Is it getting back in the bedroom? Is it spending time with your kids? Cause it's really for them. Most of it, it's not about their health. (laughs) So (laughs) it's with kids, parents care about their kids health. And they will do what it takes for their kids' health to be them best, their best selves. At least I did as a mom. And I think most parents would and for their grandchildren. So that was my, that's my story. That's why I'm a little bit, I guess, obsessive or passionate maybe as a better word about pediatric is if someone could have gotten to my dad, maybe he would have had a whole different life, you know, and I, I'm planning on my children having a very different life than my dad. Wow. Thanks for telling us the story. That's, uh, I, I wish it didn't take that for you to get so involved, but gosh. Right. Right. But I think that's sometimes what happens anything in life that you go through, like, why is this happening? Why is every single person in my family sick with airway issues? And I really don't think my family's that different. I just think, you know, I think my family is like a lot of families. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was at the hospital at 11 o'clock last night with my daughter who just delivered her first baby. Oh, and, congrats. <laughs> and, and it was interesting. He was all swaddled up on his back and there was a, a little note on his chest that said, uh, back sleeping only, or I like to be on my back. Something like that. Really? So, yeah, it's it's on the little swaddle thing that he had on. Like it's th- like it's like telling everyone, leave me on my back. Right. <laughs> oh. And we all know that's about a breathing thing. That's a, that's about SIDS and 
And yeah. so that is the current thought anyway. And that's changed over the years. And it keeps so, changing. I, I keeps know, changing. I know. Um, and, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, kids are a lot different. We're, we're trying to get all of our adult patients to sleep on their side, yes. not on their back. And yeah, back to, sleeping is what? not ideal <laughs> position for humans no. ever. No, and this and, newborn and, yeah. that's been out of the womb just a couple of hours, we're making him sleep on his back. So, And we're having him and this little sweet baby's little jog, you know, it's just, it's fighting gravity. It's, it's yes, just, yes. and we also know supine sleep induces nasal congestion. Um, So it's like, really, there's not a reason. The only people that tend, well, you know, kids with huge adenoids, they do better on their back. Is that right? Yeah. So their, their airways are better on their back, but it's because their adenoids are so huge on that posterior nasal pharynx that when they lay on their back, the adenoids pull back. Yeah. But that's it. It's, it's, you know. So really, what do you need to do instead of sleep on your back is get your adenoids <laughs> removed yeah, or, or get your allergies figured out. But yeah, yeah. it's it, it's crazy. Uh, it's a, it's truly a pandemic. And there's so many factors to it, Kent. It's like there's definitely the mechanical side, you know, and we are really good at that part with, you know, stabilizing mandibles and creating a bigger area for that tongue. It's a, a lot of um, mechanical anatomy that we're, you know, helping people with, and even with expansion, making a bigger box for that tongue and getting the jaw more forward in children and adults too. But there are a lot of other things that affect sleep and sleep health that are physiological, non-anatomical. I know you, you understand that very well with endocannabinoids and, um, cannabinoid science and vitamin D and magnesium. And we are a nutritionally deficient, you know, world, especially in America. So there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, I think the, you know, the dentists that are going to be coming to the round table and, and watching this video or listening to this podcast, I think in general, you know, they, they, most of them have average dental practices where they see all ages and what should they be looking for? They go in to see a, a four-year-old and mom's in there. They're checking that patient in hygiene. What should they be asking? Should it start even before that? Should something be on the health history? Yes. Yes. Okay. So tell us about that. So I, I started changing on our pediatric health history. Um, I started changing questions I asked because it would segue you know, when the parents are filling that out and they're like, Hmm, why is my dentist asking if my child has a lot of ear infections? Why is my dentist asking if my child wets the bed? Why is my dentist asking me, um, if my child has a lot of, uh, drooling or mouth breathing at night, um, or has ADD and all these other things Mm -hmm. If parents are like, what does this have to do with a dental visit? So that'll spark a conversation. Um, and it's really interesting because we see these kids more than their pediatricians do typically at least twice, yeah, you know, twice exactly. more a year than, so we're seeing them more than the pediatricians. Um, and a lot of times on the health history, I mean, you'll see that they're on maybe allergy medication, or they might be on ADD, ADHD medication. And that will immediately alert me as to why is this child on a stimulant? Why do we have this child on basically a form of, you know, amphetamines? Um, So when you're watching and we all know those kids in the chair, they're moving all over the place and um, they won't sit still and they're touching everything. So those are things that would spark a conversation. Um, And a lot of times it's planting seeds with parents. In the very beginning, I used to be the, have to educate and save all these kids right now. And some parents, they're just, some are so elated when you ask them because they've been trying to figure out what the problem is with their child and no one's helping them. They are so beyond grateful that you're saying, you know what, I'm concerned about your child's sleep. Can we talk a little bit more about that? 
most parents are like, really? Yeah, that's, yeah, their covers are all over the place. They get up all the time. They have anxiety to fall asleep. Um, they have dreams and nightmares, you know, uh, constantly getting up, walking around. It's like they're asleep, but they're awake. I mean, there's all kinds of things you'll hear from parents. But then you're going to have some parents that just kind of look at you like, why is my dentist asking me this? Which is no different than the adults. Sometimes yeah. they're like, why is my dentist asking if I snore? Mm-hmm. You know, my, my physician should have handled that. So there are definite things that um, you can look at definite comorbidities on a health history, but then I'll go over to at the round table, clinical signs, um, yeah. which is definitely, I think you'd be shocked how many kids are breathing through their mouth. And it, and it doesn't have to be that Napoleon dynamite look where his jaw is hanging down. I mean, that's really bad mouth breathing, but if their lips aren't sealed and they're sitting in the chair, just kind of like this, I mean, their mouth breathing. And so a little trick I sometimes do, and I suspect that a child cannot breathe it through their nose, especially if I take a CBCT and I see these huge adenoids, mm-hmm. um, I will take one of my business cards or I'll take one of the, uh, just to show mom. You know, and I'll even ask the kiddo, you know, do you breathe more through this pointing to their nose or this pointing to their mouth? Kids have no clue where they're supposed to breathe. So they'll say a lot of times they'll tell you my mouth and then I'll have the discussion. Well, what is your mouth for? And they'll tell me all the things they think their mouth is for. And then I'll say, well, what is your nose for? To smell. And I'm like, well, and also to breathe. So a lot of parents don't even realize that. So I'll have them take a business card and just kind of while I'm talking to the parent and I'll kind of give the parent a wink. And I'm like, I have a suspicion you're having a hard time breathing through the right place. And so we're going to play a little game here and I'm going to have you hold this card and I'll have them just hold it. And I'm like, you can't let your lips come apart. You can't drop the card. The card has to stay just like this. They can't, they have to breathe through their nose that way. But what's interesting, the kids that, um, I mean, they should be able to do that for one to three minutes. Most kids are like, you know, they're fine. They just watch TV and zone out. But the kids that struggle mouth breathing, they struggle with mouth breathing and don't breathe well through their nose. You'll see them do this and it's, and I'll explain it. Oh, and yeah. they'll, and they'll, and the mom will see it like, <laughs> and then the parent goes, Oh my gosh, she just breathed through their mouth. And I said, Oh, they sure did. So let's get them to the ear, nose, start doctor. So the doctor can get you breathing through the nose because your nose has all these things in it to help fight viruses and back, especially during all the stuff we're going through with COVID right now, you want to be breathing through your nose, not your mouth. So uh, <laughs> it helps the parent understand. Yeah, we, we talk to our adult patients certainly about breathing through their nose and how important it is. And what I have found, and this is just anecdotal and I don't have any statistics on it, but it seems like when I'm trying to figure out if they're obligatory versus habitual nose right. breathers, yeah. it's, it's about 50-50 with the adults. Yeah. Would you say with the kids, it's almost always obligatory? It's not a habit at that point? I would say, and again, anecdotal, what I'm seeing in my practice is a lot of times it starts, I think, regardless of what it turns into, if it turns into habit, I think it it had to be obligatory to begin with. Right. Because as humans, that's not what, I mean, these babies, like your little grandson yesterday, those little lips should be sealed breathing through their little nose and you can't even tell they're breathing. Right. That's just natural. And it's this little, and their little diaphragm is so quiet and something happens along the way that changes that. Um, I, and it's usually in childhood Um, and adults will say, and I've had a few adults say, you know, I used to breathe through my nose and I know exactly when I stopped breathing through my nose. And it was when I got a hamster or I got this pet. And that's so funny that you're bringing this up, but that's rare. I think they always, they had something going on in childhood. So my experience is get them to the ENT, at least remove, it could be allergies. It could be, uh, you know, whatever, usually adenoids or swell bodies in the septum and 
get at least the physical obstruction out of the way. And then we can talk about the habitual, because again, I talk to a lot of ENTs like you have. Sometimes they'll say, look, I, I've done all I can. I think it's a habit at this point. And it's literally like Christian Guimano said, it is nasal disuse. They literally, their organs almost turned off. They ha- you have to turn it back on again. And that's training. But yeah, with the kids, I think it's mostly a physical obstruction. Yeah. Yeah, I would think that. And, and, and because, well, especially at the four-year-old, where we know their tonsils and androids are the largest compared yes, to the yes. skulls. Yeah, I find it interesting in my, in my sleep seminars, when I start talking about kids, you can look out over the group and you can see usually moms that are team members. They're like perking up and they're, yes. they're like glued to that conversation because they really do care. So I think you're right. I think in general, parents really do care about their kids. Especially I do. if it's impacting their, their growth, we know that it retards growth if they're yeah. not breathing well. It retards growth. And I mean, the study that uh, David Gazal did um, he's now, uh, he used to be at Chicago and he is in, um, actually Columbia, Missouri now at Mizzou where my son's going to college soon, but David Gazal put out a paper that looked at children that snored between four and six years old that no longer snore now at 13. And they were in the bottom third of their class. Wow. So even though they don't currently snore, there's that window of cognitive development between that four to six year age. And if you don't fix it around that age, it is long-term deficits. So that we got a sweet spot. And and this is where Steve Carstensen nailed it. He had said this at the most recent pediatric airway symposium. He said, I really believe that the general dentist is going to be the primary care physician of the airway. And I agree because we are seeing the craniofacial issues. We're seeing, um, we can put the puzzle pieces together like no other healthcare provider can. And you can become a triage. Like I know people are like, oh, I don't wanna expand kids. And that's fine. You don't have to be the one that expands them, but you can start building a team in your community and find that orthodontist willing to do it. Get your ENT that's progressive and ready to take action and start getting these kids on a totally different path to save, you know, you, what the life you change just by intervention is huge. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, boy, I can't wait to hear your talk at the round table. This is going to be fascinating. And I hope everyone that comes out to take uh, to that watches her course is ready to take notes. You guys, this is so important. It, it's going to change the lives of future generations. And, you know, you also co-founded a study club, a mentorship program, et cetera, called ASAP. Um, yes, tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So it's ASAP pathway, which is two reasons, you know, airway, sleep and pediatric pathway, but it's also ASAP as soon as possible. So when you identify the struggling child, you intervene ASAP. Because we all want to paint an airway for adults. You really want to paint an airway for a growing child. Um, so we have an online um, educational forum and mentorship community. Um, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. And we, and we just learn from each other. Because this really is, I mean, sleep medicine is a new science. But pediatric sleep medicine, man, it is changing and it's nice to have everyone together in the community looking at literature and, and growing together and, and helping everybody. So, I mean, it is just been a dream of mine to be able to educate more dentists because you sometimes feel like you're just not getting anywhere. <laughs> and it's like yeah. the more dentists that know this, yeah, it's rewarding. You know that like when you look at a room full of people and you know, they're going to go back and change lives. There is something so internally rewarding to know that there's some little kiddo out there that's going to be in a different, a different place in their life because of that. So yeah, I co-founded ASAP pathway and, um, it's really getting some attention from, um, the medical community as well. And I think that's very important that we start having more collaboration because they need to see the dentist as part of this, uh, solution. 
Yeah. What is the website for that? Oh, I'm sorry. It's asappathway.com. So it's A-S-A-P pathway.com. And if you go there, um, there's a, there's a spot that says, uh, get a free gift or, um, free gift for you. It's something like that, but that is our way of getting out these screening forms to people. So if you want to go there, download, there's diagnosis forms and screening forms and data collection forms on there. Um, and I also do have the forms I use for when I want to do blood work and things like that as well. So that's on there as well. All for free, huh? All for free. Oh, so wow. just start, just start looking at it and, and it'll, you know, it'll, at least get you aware of what you should start thinking about and looking at in your practice. And then you can go from there and decide, you know, are you going to screen and refer? Are you going to screen, refer and intervene yourself with some myofunctional devices or expansion devices? So there's the whole gamut for dentists to, to be a part of this solution. Yeah, I think Dennis should be. And I, I would agree with Carson. I think that, yeah. that we are the future. And I think that education is so important. And it it really hits you even deeper with, when you're talking about children than it does adults. And it, it or it should, let's put it that way. Yeah, it should. It should. Because <laughs> one of our taglines is because kids can't wait. You You can't make children wait. Yeah. Um, they don't know any different. They've never, if they've never had a good night's sleep or breathed well in their life, um, they got a whole new world waiting for them if you intervene. So yeah, it's, it's very, very rewarding. And they're so freaking fun to work with too. And, uh, parents are very appreciative when they get to that ENT and the ENT says, who sent you here? Yeah. And they want to get to know who this dentist is too. So it, exactly. it is definitely a practice builder for you as well when you do that. Because all the adults you're treating have children and grandchildren and that might have breathing problems. So yeah. <clears throat> we know that's genetic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Ochoa. You've uh, you've certainly enlightened us in this podcast, and you'll even do more so with the round table. That's October Exciting. 7th through 10th in Dallas. Uh, you can come out and, and I don't, are you uh, speaking on Friday or Saturday? I can't remember. I believe Friday. Friday. All right. Yeah. You don't want to miss her. Uh, for those of you that haven't registered for the round table, again, it's in Dallas, October 7th through 10th. Just go to sleeproundtable.com. There'll be hundreds of dentists and their teams there to hear people just like Dr. Stacey Ochoa. So thank you so much for being with us today. And I look thank forward you, to seeing you in October, Stacey. I'm here. Looking forward to it very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.